Good evening, relatives. I'm glad to be back here with you on this beautiful day. What a beautiful day Mahun has given us. So I remember last week when I was in here, we we're about all froze solid, but now tonight it's a lot nicer. And uh, um, I have sweatpants on, but I was thinking about coming in my shorts and just hiding my legs. You know how they do on the TV. But so anyway, I'm honored to be here tonight. We're going to talk. We're going to review origin, talk a little bit about Ho-Chunk Encyclopedia, and then I'm going to start in on the superheroes. And you have a writing assignment again this week, and I want to thank those of you who sent your origin stories in. They were beautiful, mystical, great. They were so good. I just really enjoyed reading them. I told uh, Eleanor I'll have to send them on to her so she could read them. Uh, my brother Jim and um, Germany, your story was just beautiful, made me cry. And then um, I got um, Ilona's granddaughter's story. That was beautiful too. And um, I got a funny story from Amanda. Amanda, you can do better than that. I know you can. Send me a, make something up. She said she probably was a giant when she was put on the earth. But anyway, uh, so let's. Um, I'm grateful all of you made the effort to send me an email story. Doesn't have to be very long, you know, just a paragraph or two about how mystical, mystically you came into this, uh, this existence. If you remember, our origin stories are so that we can pass on our history. We have stories about migration, moving around, why are we in where we are, what is our purpose here, and um, in Dearly on Ho Chunk Encyclopedia, there's a lot of stories that talk about why Mauna uh, did with us as he did on this creation. So it's good if we read those things because I think that what we know about our origin helps us to understand how important we are to this existence. You know, if we were just dropped here like a globe of clay or something. Uh, maybe we wouldn't feel as important when we kind of get the blahs or whatever. But if we read and understand our origin stories and our own family origin stories, people suffered and sacrificed for us to be in this place. So we need to carry that, um, that honor and pride of our ancestors because we're the prayers the ancestors made. We're the answer to those prayers. We have to remember that. Um, we can't mistreat ourselves or think of ourselves as less than because we were put here for a purpose. And the Creator loved us. And because He loved us so much, He made sure that we were looked after once we got here. Then He put the men and the women on. In all of creation, it said that the Creator Mauna set, set about uh, working on creation. And one of the things I always think is interesting is that he says that he noticed that the two-legged walkers were being preyed upon by the monsters. Now, we're going to talk about monsters probably next week or the week after, but there were a lot of monsters that we had to contend with. And we may think of monsters like um, Mothra and Godzilla and King Kong, but in those traditional days, in the ancestors' days, the monsters could have been everything, anything. Bad weather. In this day and age, I always think of the monsters uh, being like the alcohol and drugs that's on our streets, the violence. Those are spirit entities. We know that from our teachings. All of our teachings talk about everything has a spirit and everything, uh, you know, because of that spirit has certain behaviors. And it interacts with us two leggings in a certain way. And it's un in our power, if we understand this origin, we understand how important it is for us to deal with those spirits in a good way. And all of the teachings um, from the stories and all the teachings from our ancestors tell us that. You know, we're not supposed to be drinking and drugging and uh, being mean to each other and shooting each other and doing all those things. We're supposed to, uh, we're sacred entities that have been put here to take care of the grandmother, the earth. And so um, we got a big job. 
And there's a lot of things that are against us, those monsters that are against us, the mining corporations, the big wind turbine co corporations, the water hog people, the oil pipeline people. I mean, psh, pick something. Um, COVID, that's a monster. So anyway, we have to remember that as uh, sacred entities, our origin and our purpose here is way beyond just, you know, being here and dying. There's more to it than that. We have things to take care of. Um, also, the origin stories will tell us how we got here and where we came from. Um, the Ho-Chunk origin is um, how we came into this, this part of the country was not from the Bering Strait. That goes against everything that our migration stories teach. There's stories that talk about our migration from the South, actually. And I get in big arguments with my anthropology friends at the university about this, but I believe that, that we came here from the South. Um, David Smith explained to me in his studies, and he went down there and spent time and studied with the Mayans and the Olmec people, and their stories are similar to, their, their encounter stories are similar to identify us, the Ho-Chunk, as part of those people that used to live down there. And we moved out because they got to fighting amongst themselves, the Olmecs, the Toltecs, the Mexica, the Maya, and the Maya at this time were growing. They were like a big metropolis reaching out further and further. Um, and as they got bigger and bigger, you know, some of those uh, Mayan cities had 50,000, 100,000 people in them. I'm like, my Lord, where did everybody go to the bathroom? You know, because I know when I get four or five people at my house, we run out of toilet paper right away. So it's like, where do 50,000 people, how did they uh, manage that? So they got to fight amongst each other because they needed more room and they needed more toilet paper. <laughs> I should write an origin story about that, I guess. And so then the Ho-Chunk leadership said, you know what? This is getting to be a bad neighborhood. We need to get out of here. And these guys are taking our farmland and eating up all our food and, you know, killing the big animals and whatnot. If you guys ever watched that movie, Apocalypto, that's kind of a little bit of a Hollywood version of maybe what happened. So we left. And because we were from that part of the country, we knew we could stay along the Gulf Coast and fish and eat, you know, wild boars and whatever, and make our way north out of there. And we come to the mouth of the Mississippi River and we started coming north. And then we got to the mouth of the Ohio River, the Green River, and those rivers that are over there along the western edge of uh, Kentucky. And we went up there and then we settled there, us and 29 other tribes from the Missouri River area were all there at the same time. And the reason we could kind of survive that way, we all spoke a similar dialect. We all spoke a Siouan language. And there's even in one of the origin stories talks about um, how when the two legates formed a single nation, Mauna called them together and the clan council called everybody together and said, okay, we got to decide what language you're going to speak. And so everybody kind of talked about that and they said, let's speak Ho-Chunk. For Chunk is a word of praise. People with the voice of praise. When I first learned what Ho-Chunk meant, that's what I was told by uh, Mr. Um, White, Felix White. He said it means voice of praise. And I didn't understand all that then, but uh, the Thunderbird uh, clan, council, clan leader said, let us speak Ho-Chunk, for Chunk is a word of praise. Whenever we speak our language, it will be the voice of praise to Earth Maker. Thus, they became the Ho-Chungra. Ho -Chungra. And you know what? When I was a little girl, I used to ask my mom, mom, are there, you know, what are the cuss words in Ho-Chunk? And she said, we don't have those bad words. You know, she said, we don't do that because we're supposed to speak like we're talking to God. And I never understood that until here just uh, in the last few years when I started studying these origin myths. 
So our language doesn't have those kind of words in it. It has words that describe stuff, but it doesn't, you know, we don't have those F-bombs and all of those kind of bad words. My mom told me that a long time ago. Um, so that's why we speak Ho-Chungra, because the clan council brought everybody, the nation together and said, what shall we talk? So if we look at the linguists' um, research, and you look at the 29 Missouri River tribes, I think there's 29 of us, we all have a common root that goes back to Ho-Chunk. The Suans, we're called the Suan speakers. And that doesn't mean that our language all sounds the same, but it's, this, it's a similar dialect and it's a similar um, how the words are put together. So I'm sorry, I'm not a Ho-Chunk speaker. I know some of you out there are, and I sure appreciate that you are. And I hope that you pass that on. Um, I, Mom and I used to talk with each other once in a while, and she said she really liked that, that we could talk back and forth. So she always tried. And I asked her why she didn't talk to us kids in Ho-Chunk and teach us. She, she said, I didn't think you were interested. You know, and I'm like, well, it's not that we're not interested. It's, you know, it's a responsibility of me as a parent to teach these things. But, you know, my mom grew up in the boarding school and was taught. And my grandmother always told her, speak English in front of white people because they'll think you're rude. And I always thought that was an interesting way to look at it, too. But my mom was real articulate. You know, she spoke, spoke really good. And I think I told you guys last time, she had a stroke. She was in the hospital. And she was speaking Ho-Chunk. I was sitting by her bed, and she started speaking in Ho-Chunk. And I said, Mom, what do you want? You know, and she was talking in Ho-Chunk. And the next day, I asked her, I said, Mom, did you know you were talking Ho-Chunk? She said, no, but I was dreaming of, about my mom. So she was talking to my grandmother in her dream. And I heard her talking. That was so beautiful. And she had had a stroke and some heart stuff. And... I think we are always have that in our in our DNA. We have those remote memories, and we just have to dig in and try to get them out, you know. So um, anyway, that's what I know about the origin of the language. Uh, another thing I wanted to talk to you about um, the origin is that after Earthmaker put the two ladies down, he saw that oh, we were under a lot of stress and problems. He saw that. You know, every spirit entity on the earth was trying to hurt us. And all of us as two leggings, we were crying out for help. Help us, help us, you know, save us. The giants, um, there were other kinds of uh, bad spirits that tried to um, eat us all the time. Um, the clan uh, council and the clan leadership tried to organize us so that we could save ourselves. So they organized us into clans. It's a social organization and they organized us by um, families and by duty. So if you were a member of certain clans back in those days when we first started got, getting organized, Mauna and the clan council would assign you responsibilities in the whole community. Because if you have a big community, it's hard to get everybody to um, first of all, get along with one another and then protect each other if you're not organized into social organizations. And um, so, you know, like today in, in our communities, we have police and court and doctors and teachers. Well, in those days we had them too, but they were by clan. So our Thunder Clan, our Thunderbird Clan, our Eagle Clan, they were kind of the civil chiefs. When we were at peace, they, they kind of were thought of as, I suppose, like the mayor of the community or the leader of the community. And then the hawk and pigeon were warrior clans. And they, in a time of war, they were the leadership. And they would be like our military today, you know. And then when we were at war, they called the shots as far as what the village should be doing. Then we had our bear, bear and wolf clan. The wolf clan, I would was taught and understand from the stories, they were like the social workers. They uh, made sure everybody was 
being fed and everybody was being taken care of, the families were well. That was their job. And the Bear Clan was in charge of um, the land, overseeing what decisions were made with the land. The United States government made sure when they took us in the 1800s, when they took our leadership to DC, they made sure not to take the Bear Clan. Because the Bear Clan would not let them have land, would not sign away the land. But they would leave them purposely behind, and then they would uh, threaten the, the leadership that they took out there. And if they didn't sign, they wouldn't let them come home. So eventually, they'd have to give in and sign to come home because they held captive in, out in D.C. And, uh, you know, then they'd come home and the Bear Clan would say, you know, what did you do, Jagu here? You shouldn't have done that. And so, you know, that can break up a society if you start splitting up the families and splitting up the, the responsibilities. Um, and then you have the deer and elk. They're closely related in the old days, but the elk was always in charge of anything to do with fire and the sacred fires that, you know, even today when we have ceremony, we start a fire. Um, no matter what you are, Native American church or Kigo or, you know, Sundance or Sweat Lodge Way, there's always that fire. And it's a, I, I always think of it as the World Wide Web for other sacred fires. And there's stories about that, is that fire connects you to every other ceremony going on in the existence. Then we have our fish and snake clans. And the snake clan were the uh, sanitarians. You know, they probably told us where to set up camps, where to get water, where to go dump trash and all that kind of thing. And then there were water spirit clans, of course, they're uh, in charge of the waters. And I know my, I have a brother who taught me that every time you go to that water, offer tobacco to them water spirit clans. And he always told me, don't be around that water at night. You have no business being in or around the water at night because then water spirits don't like that. And so, you know, I'm going to listen to him, and I don't like being around the water at night anyway. It's kind of creepy, you know what I mean? You can hear that water spirits gurgle, gurgle, gurgle. So anyway, um, that's kind of how we were organized from the beginning. And Mauna saw to it that these clans also stabilized this Mauna, this, this Ma that we are on, this earth, so that we can have a good, safe place to live and have food to eat and so on and so forth. So that's what I know about kind of a basic origin of the social organization and the language and whatnot. And the other, the story goes that these 29 nations gathered together in the western part of Kentucky where all these rivers kind of ran into each other. And they gathered there and they held council among themselves. And then after a while, they started breaking off. So like the people who were way up north along the Missouri River, like the Crow, the Mandan, the Hidatsa, the Assiniboine, those guys broke off and went up the river. They said, well, we're out of here. We got to go find somewhere where we can make our own place, right? And um, a lot of them, I've, I've heard some of the crow creation, how they got where they are up there in Montana. They said, God made this place for us. It's the perfect place for the crow. And they told us to come here. So we hear that a lot in our stories too, where we're told, our leadership is told, take your people here, or take your people there. Um, there's, a, there's a migration story that deals with the bear. And um, this has to do when we were over there in uh, Wisconsin. And the bear was told by the spirit, by the Mauna and the spirits, you need to take your people and cross that big river and go west. So they're like, well, geez, we got kids, we got grandmas and grandpas. How are we going to do that? But they prayed and they figured out a way and they took um, a portion of this people and they started to cross the river, across the Mississippi. What we know as the Mississippi today, and they came west. And who came with them? There were two bands. One was called the Chawari Band. That was the Ho-Chunk, us here, um, the Iowa, the Missouri, and the Oto. They came this way, and the Osage, I think they were with them. 
Then there was another band called the Digaha Band, which had the Omaha, Ponca, Quapa, and the Ka. Maybe the old stage with them. I don't remember for sure. But and they came, but they went kind of south. So today we have the Ka in down in uh, Kansas and Oklahoma, and then we have the um, Ponca, the Oto, or Ponca and the Omaha. They came up the river here where we are today. And then we came up this river, but um, um, the Iowa stayed, they stayed on this side of the, of the Missouri River because everybody came to the Missouri River the way the story goes. And the Iowa people crossed the river and climbed up these bluffs and looked out across here. And this was all tall grass prairie in those days, way back. And um, <laughs> they took one look at that tall grass prairie and, you know, it was hot and dry. And they're like, you know what? This ain't no land for no Iowa praying people. So we're going to stay over here. So they stayed over on the Iowa side, Iowa side, where there were streams. And it was called um, Prairie Savannah. A lot of trees, little lakes, little rivers. And they could make, they could live there. They looked out over here over this prairie and they said, oh, I don't think so. But uh, the Omahas came ahead, and um, then the Missouri and Oto, when they came up across um, the northern part of what's today Missouri, then they stayed there along that big river, the Missouri River that runs across there. And they made their way down there. Those Missouri and Oto got in a big fight with each other, too. And they were fighting because their kids wanted to marry each other, and they didn't want them. Uh, the Missouri dad, doesn't this sound familiar? The Missouri dad had already promised his daughter to another young man. And of course, she ran off and fell in love with the Oto boy. And oh, all hell broke loose. <laughs> they had a big fight. So, you know, the Missouri and Oto said, okay, well, we'll forgive you, but you stay over there and we'll go over here. So the northern part of Missouri uh, was settled by the Missouri and the Oto. And they were not very friendly to each other for a long time. And then, of course, old Lewis and Clark encountered them when they came in 1804 or whatever it was. So, you know, there's a lot of those stories that we have that deal with these inner reactions among the tribes and the clans and whatnot. And you have to draw a great big schematic of it to keep it straight. You know, if Ellen and I started putting on one of these big whiteboards, it would take three or four of them to put it all together, the picture. But we know that, so we should know that we're, we have this close historical relationship with one another, you know? And it's important that we know that so we can treat each other in a good way, like relatives, you know, we're relatives to each other. So that's kind of the origin. There's a lot more to origin. Um, Today, we even have clan origin stories for the Winnebago tribe. And I know I've been told by some of my students that they ask their relatives about those. And some of them, they can't tell out loud except in ceremony. So we don't want to do, talk about it in here because, you know, I don't want to cause any um, issues with the spirits or with Mauna. So anyway, that's... Um, Kind of the origin story. Are there any questions? I know I didn't cover all of it, but you get on that whole chunk encyclopedia, and there's a page there that talks about nothing but core myths, core stories. It's a whole list, and you can click on that hot link and go to those stories, and he tells you what he knows about those stories. Like I think this is a good one. It's the stinking part of the deer ankle. What could that be about? I never did read that one. I read a lot of the other ones, so I'm going to talk a little bit about Redhorn and some of the problems he called. But there's uh, each of these characters that we're going to talk about, these hero characters, these superheroes, they have what's called a whole cycle of stories that go to their uh, existence. And um, Sometimes they're real simple and sometimes they're real long and complicated. The Redhorn cycle is really complicated and archaeologists even find 
parts of the red horn cycle on cave drawings over east by the Mississippi River, which, you know, is amazing to me because red horn and some of those guys were also incredible astronomers. They could read the stars. Um, there's a story about um, some of our uh, spiritual leaders way back when they were building the mounds. They used to have a basket of water and they had one of those big uh, octagon shaped crystals. And a certain time of year, they would go up on those bear mounds in northeastern Iowa called the Effigy Mounds. And they would have ceremony and they would put that crystal in that in that basket of water. And then, um, unfortunately, they would do a human sacrifice. And then our spiritual leaders would look in that water and from the starlight shining through that crystal, they could read the future of our tribe. And so that's a lot of power, you know, and that's a lot of, uh, those guys were like superheroes. They could say, I saw an advertisement for that Superman movie today. He said, I already gave enough for this world. And, you know, they wanted to save the world again. Well, these spiritual leaders, they saved our world as Ho-Chunks by reading this future and keeping us out of danger. That's why we're still here today. I have no doubt in my mind that if it weren't for them being able to be that superpower, we probably wouldn't still be here because they sure tried to get rid of us. Anyway, are there any questions about the origin stuff? No. Um, Somebody asked what the other animal associated with the eagle and leadership was, but um, Michael said Thunderbird. Which yeah, is Thunderbird. And the Sky Clans are the Thunderbird, the Eagle, the Hawk, and the Pigeon. And I'm not sure, when I taught this class at Little Priest a few years ago, I think some of the elder ladies were telling me they didn't think there were any pigeons, any pigeon clan members here, maybe back in Wisconsin, but there were not pigeon, and fish only has a few people left, I guess. There's, um, Ben's asking, are hero stories like a Warak? What? Are the hero stories like a Warak? Orange. What does that mean? What do you mean? I don't know. Ben, what do you mean? You can unmute yourself if you want to ask one. So, Sam. Yeah, tell me. Um, uh, I, it, they're not pronounced right in Ho-Chunk, but I know the some of the stories are, you know, the snakes are underground because it's cold, right? And that's only when you tell them, right? Right, when the snow has fallen the first time, yeah. Are the heroes, do they fall under that or no? Yeah, they all, all the stories do. Now, I think there are some stories that are particular to spring and summer, as it deals with, you know, gardens and hunting and some of that kind of thing. But um, most of our stories, this is what I was told a long time ago. We can't tell them until the snow, first snow had fallen. And there was a reason for that. It has something to do with the monsters. But um, so that's why I always taught this class the spring semester at Little Priest because I usually, by the time you know, we got rolling in the class, it would, there would be a snow. So that's how I understand, Ben. Is that what you're talking about? We're not supposed to talk, and there's some stories that you can't talk about except for in ceremony. That's what I understand. I don't know which ones those are, but I try to be very careful about what I tell. Not that okay, I know. gotcha. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for the question. Selma has a comment. Yeah. And she says, when the tribe split, the Oto have the pigeon clan. So the clan still exists, oh. but not in Winnebago. But we have family in Oto, Missouri, and that, that's the pigeon clan. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Thanks for sharing that, Selma. Thanks. That makes a lot of sense. And then um, Jamie says, what monsters? What monsters? Can you clarify what you mean by what monsters?
Carolyn said, um, you can't tell the stories because of the monsters. Oh, because oh. the monsters will come out of the ground, too. Yeah. yeah, like uh, before the snow falls, that's what I was told that the belief was that if, you, if you're talking about these stories in the lodges and stuff, there's entities, spirits, monsters that can steal them or come uh, bother you. So that's what that's the only thing I know. That's what I understand. Um, the giants were one of the monsters that gets mentioned a lot in our stories. And those giants, there's something about ice in their gut. And that if you're going to kill a monster, somehow or another you have to get at that ice. That's the only thing I understand. Um, but they will come and they can steal stories from you. And then I know the tribes in the Southwest talk about the snakes coming out of the ground and stealing stories. So that's all I know. I don't know why or anything, but, um, and we have a snake clan. I don't know why that would be one of our taboos or worries, but you know, that's all I know. Um, but let's talk a little bit about the monsters. There's, in the stories, there's always the giants. And then there's other kinds of, uh, there's, uh, my mom used to always talk about uh, Kalonks, shapeshifters. And I think they're not a shapeshifter in the, in the vein of the Chippewa with the Wendigo. Are you guys familiar with that? Ooh, that's a creepy story, the Wendigo. He's a kind of a shapeshifter. He's also a cannibal and monster and scary guy. Um, but we have a Kalong is, is uh, what I understand. This old guy told me this story a long time ago. He said they, they are shapeshifters and they aren't really, they don't hurt you or anything. They're not like, you know, King Kong or anything like that. But they will come. He said usually it's like in the shape of a dog. You see a dog and then all of a sudden you look and it's a coyote and you look and then it's gone. And, you know, that's what he told me. And he told me this when we were riding motorcycles down uh, in the timbers. That kind of creeped me out. <laughs> I was like, you're telling me this now and we might see a dog or a coyote or whatever. But he told me that those were the, the shade shifters. And they don't mean harm, he told me. He said, but they want to test you. So you just drop your eyes and start praying. And you ask that shade shifter to leave you alone. And I've found that to be true in a lot of our stories. If you're getting scared by something or it's bothering, you're supposed to maybe feed it and then ask it to leave you alone. Make prayers for it about it, you know, about your fears. And that's how I understand these stories teach us to do those things. And, you know, so the column, and my mom used to always, uh, when someone would dump to our house or we you know, hear an owl hoot or something. Oh, humbug. He needs, she go, and I think that means I'm scared. And I'd say, Mom, don't do that. She'd laugh at us. She liked to scare us, but then she would explain, you know, that there's nothing to be afraid of. But you got to recognize those spirits that they are there and that you don't want to hurt them or harm or, you know, do anything to them. And you don't want them to do anything to you. I do that when I drive home from here. I go up Hatchet Hill, and you know the deer. I always start praying for them about the roundabout, that they, you know, that that I do no harm and that they do not any any harm to themselves. And I think that's what these monsters are supposed to teach us: is how to deal with our fears, how to deal with some of that. And I'm not saying that the monsters aren't real, because they are. The things out here on the streets that are tempting our kids, those spirits, they are real. My mom used to tell a story, too, about a no-faced woman. Her and my auntie and her sister, her friends were playing over at the old school. It was across the, across the highway over here. And um, she said, we used to crawl up on top of the roof and sit up there and laugh and talk. And she said, it got late, so uh, Lou and I, that's her sister, my aunt Lucille, she said, we decided we better go home. So we shinnied down off the roof and we started walking across the field. Um, 
that field that's the brand new spanking new football field was just weeds and brush. And they started walking across because they lived on that last street at the north end of town here, up on a hill. And mom said it was real scary because it was one street light. It was at the highway at the bottom of the hill where they lived. So mom said, her and my aunt started walking across there and all of a sudden they heard somebody was following them. So they turned around and looked and they saw a figure that looked like it had a blanket on it. And they said, who are you? And it didn't say anything. So they thought, well, we better get going. We don't know who that is. So they started walking across that field and mom said, we started getting faster and faster. And she started grabbing my Aunt Lou and they started dragging across the field and that, that person or that thing in the blanket just kept right behind them. You know, even speed as they were coming across the field. And mom, you know, said, she said to my aunt, come on, we gotta run. So they started running and that thing started running right behind them. And it was just far enough off. She said, let's go to the light and get home. So they ran to the light on the highway. And in those days, mom said this highway uh, 77 was just gravel dirt at that time. And they ran up the hill and mom said, halfway up the hill, she looked back and that thing came under the light. And it didn't have no face. And so she really gave out a, a heeny and <laughs> grabbed my aunt. They ran up because my grandmother's house was right at the top of that hill. And um, the door, the lights were out and the door was locked. So they ran across the street to Jenny Johnson's house. She lived over there with her mom. And they, she said, let us in, let us in. And so Jenny's mom opened the doors. What's the matter with you girls? You know. And they come running in, and mom said, something's chasing us. And they looked out, and as it come around the corner, they could see it under the next street light, and it didn't have no face, that woman or whatever it was. So mom, they were just screaming and hollering, <laughs> ran in there, and then when, finally it went away. And uh, I suppose my grandmother heard them screaming and hollering, and the light came on in their house, so they ran across the street and went home. And uh, they told my grandmother that they had seen this thing. And my mom, my grandma told them, well, what were you doing? Those kind of things come out when you're being naughty, when you're not doing what you're supposed to do. And I know that um, some of my students when I was teaching here would go down to the timbers and they would see Harry Man or Stick Man or whoever. And I said, well, what were you doing down there? Oh, we were just hanging out. Oh, sure they were. I said, were you drinking? Well, maybe a little bit, Mama, maybe. Well, that's what they came for. They come to tell you, don't do that stuff. Because you're not. I learned that from my mom. So anyway, those are some of the scary entities that my mom talked about and that I've read about in our community here. I know that Red Squatch, uh, Harry Man, Yeti, whoever it is, you know, People always ask me about that thing, and I say, you know what? They're spirit entities. You're not going to find bones or poop. You're not going to lock them out of your house. They can walk right through this wall right now. If they do, I'm going to tell Eleanor, get them. So <laughs> then I'll run to my car. <laughs> but, you know, they can go. They can. You can't. You have to pray and protect yourself in that way, I think. And that's the monsters. Today, in, a, in this day and age, Alcohol, violence, meth, um, hopelessness, all those things are the things that are the monsters for us, I think. Um, sometimes we have names for them, sometimes we don't, but we just know they are there. And um, my mom used to always tell it, my sister and I, that she said, you know why you're scared. I said, yeah, because that's a scary thing. She said, no, it's because you're naughty. I don't think I was ever that naughty, but anyway, um, that's a little bit about the monsters. And the creator, Mauna, wanted to make sure that we were protected from monsters, whatever they were. And he sent three sons down. He sent the hare, which is a rabbit. He sent turtle. He sent a guy named Bladder. His one son was named. Son was named Bladder, and there was Redhorn, 
We had five. And the other one was a one-legged entity. He was called Harris Janina. A long time ago, I had some older students in my storytelling class, and they said they used to be told that Harris Janina was like Satan. He was the battle, the devil, the bad guy. But not really, because we don't have that in our worldview. We don't have a Satan or a devil. We have spirit entities that can cause us problems, but most of the times the teachings are that that stuff comes from inside us, that bad, bad uh, spirits, those monsters. So we have to learn to deal with that. Um, Mauna sent, the first superhero he sent down to kill the monsters was Redhorn. And Redhorn, um, he was one of them all-American guys. <laughs> he was a good athlete. He really liked to run, race, and wrestle. And he was real, you know, evidently he must have been real good looking and real muscly. The women all loved him, and he kind of liked that. He was kind of a womanizer. But anyway, he was sent down to um, get after the giants. And he could never out-wrestle them. He tried to, he would challenge them and they would wrestle and he would always get defeated. And so Mahuna thought, well, I better send somebody else down there to help him out. So he sent Turtle. And his son Turtle was a pretty good wrestler as long as you don't get him on his back, right? Turtle on his back. But he was pretty good. But the problem with Turtle is that he liked to create... Um, he liked to create dissonance among people. And it, the story is told that the turtle brought war to the two legates. That he brought war. And so after that started, uh, Mahuna said, well, listen, boy, you're not doing a very good job, you know? And so you're supposed to help your brother Redhorn kill the giants so we save the two legates. And turtle was so enamored with war because, you know, there's a whole set of ceremonies and stories that go along with preparing for war. And us ho are really value the warrior mentality. And, you know, one of the greatest things in the old days that you could do is to die in battle. That would be a great honor for your family and whatnot. But anyway, so Turtle brought war for the people. So Mahuna said, well, that isn't exactly what I wanted you to do, right? So he jerked him off of that duty, and he sent um, his next son, whose name was uh, Hare. I don't know how to say it in Ho Chunk. I'll have to have somebody help me. But it, it, Hare is the big rabbit. You know, you can think of it in that terms. Hare had a light for the girls, and he spent a lot of time trying to hustle women, and that kind of caused him to not pay attention to saving the two legs. But he did do one thing for us that is still here today, and he created the Medicine Lodge. That's the story. And why did he do that? He um, loved two legs. He loved us. And he went to his grandmother, who had created him or helped him be, you know, be a hero. And he said, Grandmother, I love these two legs so much. I just don't want them ever to have problems or have to die. And grandmother, who is a metaphor for the earth, because he came out of the earth. And you know, rabbit nests are in the earth, right? So he came out of the earth out of the mother's womb. And he was always um, crying to her that he wanted us to live forever. And she was like, you know, that's not, that's not a good thing because if they live forever, then there's going to be starvation. They're going to eat all the food. There will be overcrowding. There will be disease, um, which we know today. That's, you know, we have too many people on the earth, maybe. And she said, you can't let them live forever. But maybe you can find a way that their spirit can live on. So he spent a lot of time in prayer and thinking about it, talking to his grandmother, talking to Mahona. And he decided that he would create a way for us to live that would ensure that our spirit would live forever. 
So he created the medicine lodge. And in that hair cycle, in the rabbit cycle, he talks about how he got with all the clans and each clan has a piece of that lodge. When you build a Kigo, you know, there's certain parts of it that belong to certain, um, one of our clan members, like the snakes, the buffalo, the, you know, deer, they all have places in that lodge and that's how the hare created it. And then he created so that if you pass on, if you make your journey, um, you have a choice. If you left, if you lived a good medicine lodge life or the good way, you can choose to, your spirit can choose to stay here and want the earth as a free spirit or you can go to the spirit world and go on one of the roads, whether you're a, a veteran, a warrior, or uh, you know, a human being, or you can go to the spirit world and you can come back in as another uh, entity, as a human being. So those three things, if you are um, a follower of this way, this worldview, then supposedly the hair made it so that you could come back or you could stay. You know, you weren't going to go wandering off to the underworld or anything. Or you could go to the spirit world and, and have your special uh, uh, place there. So that's one thing that the hair in the hair cycle talks about. He loved humans so much that he gave us that way of life. Um, and then there's the Harestunina, the one-legged guy. He was um, put to rule the underworld. And way back, this comes out of uh, the Maya and the Olmec and their teachings is that when you first pass, you go to the underworld first. And then there's uh, offerings and understandings that you gain there, and then you move on up to the spirit world. So I know I put that in a real simple way. It's a lot more complicated than that, but I've never been there, so I don't know what it's really like. So, um, someday probably. So anyway, that's what I know about the, the sons. Oh, that bladder. There's one that's called bladder. And he, he was real arrogant. He didn't help the two ladies at all. And uh, Mauna was really fed up with him and called him back. Uh, he was called bladder. He was real arrogant and uh, conceited. And he used to go around, I guess, they said, and he'd say, we're going to war, we're going to war. So he'd get everybody all fired up. And in the old days, they used to have to go on a bear hunt and have a bear feast before they went to war. So he'd get everybody all psyched up to go hunt bear. And then they'd come back and they'd say, oh, never mind, they called the war off or something like that. Ooh, that made everybody mad. He's lucky he didn't get beat up, actually. But he didn't. And... Uh, that's kind of his claim to fame is that he was so, and he got a bunch of his uh, relatives, his cousins, his little huge case, he got a bunch of them killed because of his behavior. And that didn't sit very well with his brothers. So he kind of got a bad, he not thought of very highly by the other brothers. So anyway, we all have one of those brothers, don't we? I'm just kidding. Anyway, um, that's the brothers and uh, a little bit on the monsters. I'm trying to think. Redhorn, um, you know, he was always kind of a real cool guy, I guess. But one day he went out, was it on a bear hunt? I believe the story goes. And while he was out there, this young woman from the village whose mother wanted her to marry Redhorn. This girl followed him out on his hunt. And she just kind of snuck around and stalked him, I guess is what we call it today. And she, oh, she just wanted so bad to be with him. So she finally got him, caught up to him and said, you know what, Redhorn? Um, I would really like to be with you. Would you like to be with me? He's like, are you kidding me? No, I don't need any women right now. Besides, I can have my pick, and you're not one of them. He kind of made her mad, I guess. 
You know, you Winnebago women don't like to hear that stuff. Hey, I'm just kidding. <laughs> anyway, so she got all huffy and snotty and went back to camp. She told her mom that he had promised to marry her and that they had slept together and that he was going to come back and announce to the tribe that she was going to be his wife. And the mom was so happy. Oh, I'm so proud of you. Oh, that's so good. He will make you a good husband. So she made the girls start preparing uh, clothes for Benorn and preparing clothes for herself for the wedding. And then her mom spread it all over the camp that she was with the Red Horn. And everybody was like, what? Her? Why would he do that? And you know how uh, us old women talk. Anyway, here come Red Horn back to camp finally. And everybody's like, oh, we're so happy for you. Oh, congratulations. And Red Horn's like, what are you talking about? And they said, well, we heard that uh, you promised to make... Um, this girl, your wife, and she's prepared all your moccasins and your breech cloth and your shirt. She prepared her 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 wrap. She's ready to get married. He said, I did not do that. So he told the mom, she's lying. I didn't, none of it's true. And so the mom was all embarrassed and got after the girl. But the thing about it is this girl had prepared this beautiful white beaver skin as part of her uh, wedding dress. And you know, when they when they dry beaver skins, they're dried round. And this is a white, beautiful white beaver skin. And it's called the story of the girl in the white beaver skin. And uh, it took me a long time to figure out what they were talking about. But when it was all said and done and they got it all straightened out, that white beaver skin represents the full moon. You know, it looks like a big round white. And so she's connected to that. It's called the girl in the white beaver skin when that full moon is out like that. And we're reminded of the Red Horn story. You know, he was quite a quite a man, I guess. I don't know. A lot of stories about him are. Um, and the other interesting thing about Red Horn is we find evidence of those stories in caves and cave drawings. And they found pipes, pipe bowls that they call the big boy. And they're uh, in the shape of uh, a head of a man. And the other thing that Redhorn had was he had human heads as earrings. That was his claim to fame. You know, you kids wear those gauges. He had human heads as gauges in his ears. And when he was wrestling and doing competitions and stuff, those human heads would look at the, the opposition and stick their tongue out, make faces at him. And everybody kind of got creeped out by those. But he wore these human heads as his ear. Now you say, well, what's that about? Well, there's a story that goes along with that. Back when we were migrating here, when we came across the Mississippians, and we were coming way a long time ago, Jesus was... Uh, like 1100, 1200, something like that. And our the tribe came in contact with the uh, Mississippian culture at a place called Cahokia by St. Louis over there east. And when we came upon the Mississippians, they didn't like us very much. So we started kind of bickering and arguing. And um, we, we were at war with them for 300 years. The story goes, I can't imagine that, but you know, these are spirit entities a long ways back. They have powers. So we were aboard of them for 300 years. And after a while, the Mississippians were saying, you know, this is dumb. We're losing people and we're using a lot of resources. So they he negotiated the chief of the Mississippian. He negotiated with who else? Redhorn the Great. And he said, hey, you know, let's let's stop making war. And so you know how men are. So what they do? So Redhorn said, "Okay, you give up." And the priest from the Mississippi said, "No, you guys give up. Said, no, you give up. No, you give up." And so finally they said, "Well, let's settle this with the ball game." 
So they played the sacred ball game. You guys have probably seen that on TV where the hoop is on the side of the ball and they play in this big plaza and they have to hit it with their feet or their knees or their hip and they have to knock it through that, that hoop. Um, and that's how you score. And the game goes on until somebody scores, you know? Well, evidently, they played two out of three, of course. You can't have a good story without suspense. So they batted two out of three and they split. And then the, uh, or three out of five, I'm sorry. Then the third one, the Ho Chunks won. So they're like, yeah, we won the war, we won the war. You gotta give up, you gotta give up. So the priest from uh, Cahokia called his ball team together and he cut their heads off and hung them on a rope and hung them around the neck of Redhorn the Great. And that's, that's how we represent that victory is with those earrings that are made of human heads. That's how the story goes. And, you know, I'm sure Redhorn was like, ick, but, you know, he won. So they declared the peace. And then also, old, uh, the leader from the Mississippi said, and I'll give you my wife, or my daughter as your wife. And the story is that <clears throat> she was called the red-headed woman. She was tall, six over six foot tall. And um, she was called the red-headed woman. So that was his new wife. So after that, then, you know, the Ho-Chunk stayed around and helped the Mississippians build back up their community. And then the Mississippians took them north to what's today Wisconsin. And they, they took them and had the Ho-Chunk had us help build the uh, Aztalan, the Walking Bear Mounds, all those mounds that are up there in uh, Wisconsin and Northeastern Iowa. The Ho-Chunk were uh, attached to build those along with the Mississippian. Because the Mississippian just thought we were just so powerful and spiritual and, you know, they really honored us really by allowing us to help them build those. I visited Aztalan. That's an interesting place. If any of you Winnebago people ever get a chance to go out there, it's a state park now, and it's really interesting. <clears throat> they tell a wrong story, but that's okay. You know the real story. So we helped uh, build that, and there was <coughs> there was a burial mound there <coughs> that had, I think they said. 12 or 15 human <laughs> sacrifices. And I'm not sure that we did that sacrificing, but I know the Mississippians, but we used to do that. So anyway, and that's how Redhorn got those earrings from that, to remind him of that battle. They went, no, you give up, no, you give up. You know, man, nobody wants to give up. <coughs> so, questions or comments? I'm not done with the monsters and the super videos. We got an assignment for you to do that you can do between now and the end of class. There are a couple of comments. Okay. So, um, Lou Bass says, Can you get me um, for recording this event for the community? I'm told to be able to be in our and find the and love the stories being shared. So thank you to everyone else who came into support as well. Um, and then Jamie said that Redhorn is the Adam Beach of Hotunk, and I don't have to be <laughs> beaches. So. He's an actor. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then Yeah, he is. <laughs> and then Amanda Fox said. She laughed when you said, oh, it's about like how men are and how they have to go like yeah. three out of five. Because it can't be like, you can't just win one. You have to yeah. more. Uh, and then she said, who did the whole time eat? Can you clarify oh, that, Anna? The cannibalism? Oh, yeah. um, I'm not sure that was true. Oh, oh, okay. There are stories about that. Paul Radin talks about it in his book. But you know what? Since I know my people a little bit, I, I'm not an expert. I'm wondering if when he was writing stuff down, you weren't teasing him. <laughs> you know, I like, I used to sit with uh, 
Felix White Sr. and he used to tell stories and joke. And I was wondering if Paul Raiden was writing furiously, okay, and then what? And then what? Because there's a story about the Illini who came up and that we ate them. And that caused a lot of problems. But anyway, um, I'm wondering if when the old timers, Sam Glowstick and those guys were telling Braden and Dearly and some of these guys that said, you know, I can just see him doing this, you know, elbowing, say, uh, you know, saying, sweet, watch his face when I say this. And then after we had, after we uh, cut their bows and attacked them, then we cooked them for supper and ate them. Can you imagine that non-native anthropologist going, <gasps> and then just riding like crazy, you know? And I'm not sure, I'm not sure, but what we were teasing or telling a story about that. Our people are like that, you know? And they've probably been like that a long time. So I don't know, um, there's evidence archaeological evidence that there was people who consumed human flesh, but I have never read anything that it was us. But I do know those people that came up from the Illini and they were going to see how we were doing. This is the story. David told me this story and he said that our warriors fell on them, cut their bowstrings and then murdered all of them. And then that they did consume their flesh. But you gotta understand too, way back in those days, uh, certain groups did that for power. There was a power thing in there. I don't know that and I don't study that. It could be. And you know, and we can't sit here as, as uh, prayers of our ancestors and judge them. That's the way I look at it. If it happened, it happened. If it didn't, it didn't. But I do know there's a lot of evidence that we did practice human sacrifice, especially when we got up here uh, along the Mississippi River. I do know that. It wasn't a lot, but that, that, that was part of the way they looked at the future of the tribe. And that's all I know. I kind of know that more because I've gone up there and done ceremony at Ten Bears on the Effigy Mounds, and um, the ancestors told me that. And they said, hey, you used to come here and do sacrifice. How come you don't do that anymore? And I had to say, we don't do that anymore. We don't take human life anymore. We offer food, cedar, tobacco, whatnot, but we don't take human life anymore. So, and they're like, oh, that's boring. No, <laughs> no, they're like, oh, all right. Well, good to know. No wonder you don't come here and do it anymore. I want to tell you how we came to use tobacco in our ceremonies too, and then I'll be done for the night. And you have an assignment. Well, the rest of the hour, while you're sitting around, drinking your pop and whatever you're doing, you have to write, Addition to your origin story, your superpowers. What superpowers were you given? How did that come about? You know, Mauna given you superpowers to do something to help the two leggeds or the world. So, what is that? And you can be as creative as you want on that. I believe you. But you just have that's the second part of your writing for this, this workshop. You guys that wrote the first round, whoo, that was good. Those were really good. So I want to congratulate you for putting that effort in and thank you. You know, you guys that didn't like my sister Brenda, you're going to flunk. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, sweet. I shamed you in front of everybody. But anyway, are there any other comments or questions? So what's your superpower and how do you use it to save or work with the two leggings? That's your assignment. And then I'd like you guys for sure to get on that whole chunk encyclopedia. Surf around there a little bit. Tobacco. 
<laughs> I learned a long time ago that we bring to tobacco comes first for our prayers, right? Um, so, I, you know, I always kind of wondered, well, how is that? And I do know that tobacco is the first commercial economic crop that the, that the Europeans shipped out of this continent. They made billions of dollars on it. But um, what did, how did that come about for us as such a sacred thing? And Mauna was giving tobacco, control of tobacco to, to some of the clan council. And the clan council was arguing about it and fighting over it because everybody, it tasted good, everybody liked using it. And so they wanted, all the clan council wanted to have control over the tobacco. And Mauna, see, this is Mauna's looking after us again. Mauna said, I don't know, those two leggeds are pitiful. They're having a hard time down there. And, and knowing how much you spirits, you clan council spirits, like this, I think I'll give it to the two leggeds to take care of. And if they need something or if they want to ask you for something, they have to offer that tobacco. And so when they offer that to you, and if you take it from them in your prayer, you have to do what they ask you to do. And so that's why we take care of the tobacco still today. Now, we haven't done a very good job of it. We made it poisonous, so it kills us. But, you know, those of you out there who, um, you know, honor that tobacco and respect it for its, its sacred purpose, you know, we're the ones... Take, or you're the ones who are taking care of it. And that was the meaning, that was what Mauna wanted to begin with. Because he knew that if he gave it to us and we, we offered it in a good way to the spirits, that they would help us. And that was his ultimate, you know, purpose for sending all these spirits down to help us, to protect us, to keep us uh, going and keep the monsters away. So tonight, you guys, offer your tobacco, make your night prayers. Be grateful for your day. We took a breath on this side. I always say that every morning. Thank you for the breath I get to take on this side. And um, lay down your tobacco for all your prayers in the morning, whenever you guys know that. So that's about, I just wanted to say about that much tonight. You have a writing assignment. Class will be over at 7.30. You should have your writing assignment done by 7.30. Thank you, relatives. That was fun. <laughs>